Welcome to the latest edition of Health Matters, which focuses on the life course approach to health and well-being. My name is Eustace D'Souza, and I'm the National Lead for Health Inequalities in the Life Course in Public Health England. The life course approach reflects how an individual's health and well-being is shaped by multiple risks and protective factors, and how these in turn can shape other people's health, even the health of those yet to come in the next generation. With me here today to discuss the life course framework are Gladys Xavier, Director of Public Health for Redbridge, Alyssa Goodman, Professor of Economics and Director of the Centre for Longitudinal Studies at the University College London, and Julie Billett, Director of Public Health at Camden and Islington. Adopting a life course approach means taking action early to ensure the best start in life. It also means taking action appropriately to protect and promote health during key transition periods. And thirdly, it means taking action together as a society to create healthy environments and improve conditions of daily life. Gladys, can I start with you? As a Director of Public Health and the Vice Chair of the Local Safeguarding Children's Board, what does taking a life course approach mean to you, for example, in the context of children living with alcohol-dependent parents? I work in a very diverse borough, which is a very, very diverse community, so well-being of children and young people is very, very important. So going back to the alcohol issue, I think that is the prevention element. So it's very important that mother parents, I'm, I'm talking here about parents as well, not just mothers, are visited early to identify any risk factors. So if you talk about alcohol, so if there are parents who are dependent on alcohol, uh, substance issues, smoking, all those are risk factors for early start in life, then you identify them early and you start putting some interventions in place. So that is really, really important. So as local authorities, we work, we work with a wide variety of people. We can't do it just in one, one agency. So it is partners, stakeholders, engaging with the whole families as well. And talking about carers, uh, we know there are some children of par parents who are substance use users. So we are responsible for commissioning substance use services. So when uh, parents are referred to the service, we always ask, ask them to check whether there are children because these are safeguarding issues. So we also embed safeguarding policies and procedures within all our work so it doesn't stand alone. See, we raise awareness safeguarding so anyone in the community or any professionals, if they suspect there are some safeguarding issues, they can ring and make a referral without being blamed or feeling guilty because that's really, really important. Thank you. Can I ask you, what do you think are the consequences of not taking a life course approach, not taking a family-based approach and not taking a prevention approach? I think that is then very fragmented. We just look at one area. So if you, if you talk, talk about alcohol, if there's substance issues, there's also mental health issues, there's domestic violence issues. So if you just only didn't take a life course approach, you would just be fragmented and really wouldn't, wouldn't have a good outcome. It would be less effective. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Evidence is key to what we do and what we should be doing. Alyssa, could you just explain the evidence behind the life course and what the current key thinking is? So we run several large national birth cohorts at UCL and they're studies that follow people from birth and across the whole of their lives. And they really strongly show the value of taking a life course approach. So I think we almost take it as common knowledge now that adversities that are experienced young can have very long lasting effects, that there are cycles of both advantage and disadvantage that cascade across generations, and also that there are interventions that we can do that can be particularly effective, especially early on in life, also in adolescence. So for example, supporting parents' mental health, um, supporting parents to provide rich home learning environments, um, but they also show us as people get older that interventions later in life can be very effective. So steps taken, for example, for behaviour change in midlife that can help improve your chances of a healthy older age, reducing stress at work, and um, once you finish work, perhaps things like social isolation step in. So interventions that can help protect people from those can be very, very effective. World Health Organisation have published extensively on, on the evidence and, and the application of research in this field. Um, what more do you think we could be doing at a local authority level and nationally to improve our knowledge and application of the life course approach? There's so many things that academics and um, local authorities 
can do together to strengthen the things that are going on. So we know that um, academic research can show just how cost effective early interventions can be because they remove the risk of harms later on in life occurring. Uh, we also know that um, our research can really illustrate the common roots of multiple problems. So what you said about fragmentation and so on, we can really point out what some of those common causes and things that occur together can be and really help shape interventions that way. And we can also be very helpful in indicating what's perhaps going to happen in the future. So thinking about how subsequent generations have different health problems and concerns. So we have big concerns now about adolescent mental health, for example, and our studies show that there are more frequent problems occurring now among adolescents, particularly girls, than there were in previous generations. Or obesity among those in middle age is more of a problem, so we can start to look to the future, what are the risks going ahead and how can local authorities start to really plan for those. So understanding local data is quite key to this, isn't it? Okay, thank you very much. Julie, we've heard about the evidence, we've heard about an example in, in another authority. What does taking a life course approach mean to you in your borough? Well, I see a life course approach as being absolutely the heart of what we do um, in local authorities, not just in public health and our role around improving health and tackling inequality, but fundamentally about the whole role of local government, really. Certainly my two authorities, a life course approach runs through everything that we do. Um, for me, it's absolutely about a focus on prevention and early intervention in everything that we do as a local authority. What are the opportunities for intervening that bit earlier, for getting a bit more upstream, and identifying those opportunities to prevent need or poor health escalating or rising in the first place, really, because that's, that's better mm. for everybody, particularly in these kind of constrained financial times when we've got less resource to respond to some of that presenting need. Um, I think it also really plays in well to uh, an increasing focus on uh, strengths and assets and asset-based approaches. It's recognising that individuals, families and communities often have many of the assets and strengths within themselves to uh, build resilience and to promote well-being. And rather than working and doing things to communities and to people, it's about working with them and in partnership to really unlock those strengths and think about how we can promote health and well-being and build resilience for now and for future generations, really. And the other bit that is really fundamental to uh, a life course approach is that focus on inequality and really thinking about, um, through that lens of prevention and early intervention, who are the particular, particular groups, particular areas, particular risk factors where we know there are particular vulnerabilities to poor health, poor outcomes, and ensuring that we are sort of taking a more targeted approach where that is necessary, the proportional universalism approach that is really endeavouring to uh, address inequalities and break that cycle of intergenerational disadvantage. Okay, thank you. Um, obviously public health's been in local authorities now since 2013, and I just wondered, what, could you just explain the unique opportunities that offers us? I think, I think there's huge opportunity from public health being in local government. I think um, partly it's about bringing with us our, our skills around the evidence base, to some of what Alyssa was talking about, and bringing that knowledge to not just public health practice in local authorities, but across a broader range of what, public, uh, what local authorities do and taking a more evidence-based approach, using data and evaluation to understand uh, the impact of some of our interventions and approaches. Um, and I think it's about thinking um, that health and well-being is not just business of public health, but it's everybody's business in a local authority. So how do we bring on board our colleagues in education, in housing, in transport planning, in the built environment, to genuinely think about their role and contribution in shaping healthy environments and promoting health, but also tackling inequality. Uh, and that is fundamentally part of a life course approach as well. Everybody has a part to play because everything matters across that life course, really, and there are opportunities throughout from, from cradle to grave, as it were, uses. So. so every life stage is critical. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. One of the challenges as well is, is obviously that from a public health specialist point of view is always waiting for the perfect evidence yeah. so that we can then go out to um, terms of public health and others to say this is the thing to do. Yeah. Um, and obviously we don't live in that world, in that universe. And I just wondered how you feel that we can work more effectively together so that we do work to the best evidence even though that evidence might not be to a particular standard. Right, so we know a lot and I think academics are often kind of very aware of the limitations of what they do, but I think there can be a confidence in, especially when we look across a whole body of research coming from different sorts of data or different disciplines, uh, I think having the confidence to say, well, we know this much and let's just act. Let's learn from what we've done and then let's improve. So we should be confident with what we already know Absolutely. without being complacent. Right, as well as thinking about where we want to learn more.
Okay. Thank you. In your authority, what would you say are the two main factors that drive or influence a, a life course approach? Well, so, as Julie mentioned, so in the local authority, we have got access to a wide range of partners. I think that is a unique point because, in my authority, they get public health. So it's not just about public health teams sitting and doing public health, it's a whole authority signed off. So it's a health and health policies approach. So that's something we have implemented. So everyone takes their public health responsibilities very seriously. So for me, the key factor is work from, from an early, earliest perspective, working with uh, children's centres, the earliest people, health visitors, schools, all of those people, bring them together to make a difference. So for me, that is one of the key factors. And the second thing is that we are responsible for commissioning the health visiting services. So one of the mandated checks they do is uh, the one at 28 to 32 weeks, which is a lot earlier than before because they used to do birth visits. So it gives an opportunity for health visitors and their teams to visit parents in their home environment. So then they can assess, look, look at for the signs of their environment. Lots of families live in poverty, so poverty is a really, really important issue. So are they sort of, if they have access to welfare benefits, or do they need debt management? So we will, that will make a really good outcome for later on for those children, or is a mum able to read? Because I know in my area where health visitors have identified, mums don't read bedtime stories because they don't read, they can't read. So what the, the health visitors have introduced is a, pic, a picture book, and also then bringing the mother into education and training so that she could read. As Julie said, we don't have a lot of money in local authorities, mm -hmm. so we really have to make, really maximise what we have. So it's really working across the, the local authority. One of the things that sometimes public health can get criticised for is being a bit of a nanny state and telling people what to do. Could you just unpick that a little bit, about taking an asset-based approach across the life course? Perhaps thinking about um, employment support, for example, to some of our... Uh, residents or our communities who um, are perhaps a bit further away from the labour market, for example, it's absolutely working with them to understand um, what are the kind of skills and strengths and interests that they do have, rather than a kind of fixed view of, um, you know, here's the labour market in Camden, or here's the labour market in Islington, and this is the kind of box that you need to fit into. It's understanding sort of what their particular strengths and interests and skills are, are you know, we've got a very diverse community as well, and they, they often will bring something that maybe traditional labour markets yeah. might not bring. So I think it's it's just about taking a view that um, really tries to put residents and, and people at the heart of whatever change you're, you're yeah. doing or outcome you're seeking to improve, um, rather than taking a kind of predetermined or fixed view. And then really understanding what, what, what they bring to the table and what we can build on and work with, rather than um, necessarily always starting with what the kind of gap or, or deficit is, really. Um, in you know, thinking about uh, older adults, for example, um, some of the intergenerational approaches that we're starting to think about in Camden and Islington are really absolutely tapping into that sense of strengths and assets. So, uh, you know, older people who are maybe socially isolated but have a huge amount to offer um, in terms of engaging with maybe some of our, our you know, working in our children's centres or volunteering, um, and that they themselves can derive huge amounts of benefit from that social contact and the opportunity to, to engage across generations and offer a huge amount of enrichment to some of our younger residents and children and families, uh, offering support to maybe more vulnerable mothers who um, feel also a bit like socialised and disconnected. So I think it's just really starting with, with our own, with our residents, with our communities and working out what they've got and what strengths they have that we can build on. And that's certainly something that comes across from the materials produced by by yourself and, and the borough, that you're as much focused on the second half of our lives as we are on the f as you are on the first half yeah. of our lives. Yes, absolutely. So in my annual public health this this year, we looked at um, how we support that healthy ageing agenda in, in Camden and Islington. Used as recognising that as a as a crucial mm -hmm. uh, point in, in the life course, really. Um, and for me, the you know the simple philosophy there is it's never too late. I think there's a sense actually when you sometimes when you can talk about the life course, a sense that if you don't get it right in the early years, you've sort of there's no no catching up. But actually, that's not true. There's a huge amount that you can do in midlife and even into into older age that is is fundamentally about prevention and early intervention. So thinking about um, bereavement or people becoming carers as a trigger for potentially a major sort of transition in their lives. Um, an ability to kind of spot those uh, those key transition points and think about what are, what's the support that, that that individual that family might need 
to ensure that they can then flourish in the next stage of their life rather than seeing it as a trigger for potentially sort of deterioration or increased social isolation, for example. Um, but it's also absolutely a place-based approach as well, so it's not just about services and interventions, but thinking about how we build communities that support that approach as well. And I think a key message from, from the work that we've done recently in Camden and Islington is actually if you build a healthy place that supports uh, older adults, it's actually a place that supports everybody. Um, so if you think about creating communities that feel, feel safe to walk around in, road crossings that give everybody a bit of time, places that have shade and a place to sit and chat, that's actually a community that everybody can enjoy, not just older adults. It's a place for everyone, really, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid we have now come to the end, but I would like to thank our expert panel members for joining me today. Local authorities are already taking holistic action on prevention across the lifespan. For example, in early years work, productive healthy ageing, and working on healthy places and good quality work opportunities. Do please take the time to explore this edition of Health Matters, which includes links to a variety of practical tools infographics, case studies and blogs. Thank you for watching.